morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to our first session for today's Yes Speaker series. Uh, today we're joined by illustrator Leandra Tanchi and graphic designer Nicola Hamilton, who will give us some perspectives on their co collaboration with the Scaries. Before we started, we would like to get before we get started, we would like to acknowledge that the land on which George Brown College is situated is the traditional territory of the Mississaugas of the New Credit First Nation and other Indigenous people who have lived on this land. Today, the meeting place of Toronto is still the home to many Indigenous people from across Turtle Island, and we're grateful to have the opportunity to work in the community and on this territory. Across the School of Design, we remain committed to identifying and removing systemic barriers to accessing college programs and services, and are committed to identifying strategies, tools, and actions to better support our Indigenous student population. In a commitment to build connections and opportunities for students to engage with designs visionaries, YES features a week-long lecture series, 18 to be exact. The design-focused speaker series has been cultivated in an effort to provide dynamic perspectives and unique discussion opportunities for members of our community, including students and faculty alike. Honest advice for designers from really good designers connects the School of Design with those who have, been in, those who have impacted the industry on a local and global scale. We encourage you to ask any questions you have for Nicola and Leandra in the YouTube chat. As part of this week's activities, we have a series of giveaways, and I'm happy to give away a limited run print by Nicola and Leandra. Um, the print goes to a YES attendee who has shown engagement and interaction across multiple sessions this week, Sage Shepherd. Congratulations, Sage. Send us an Instagram DM uh, with your address. With that, I'm happy to introduce our speakers. As commercial artists, their mandate is to translate their client's vision into the tangible, to amplify their voices, and to communicate their messaging. Nicola Hamilton is an independent art director and designer whose work has been internationally recognized by D&D, the Society of Publication Designers, and the National Magazine Awards, among others. She was an art director at Studio Wise, deputy art director at Chatelaine, and associate art director at The Grid. She teaches editorial design at Humber College and George Brown College. She's a certified RGD and the current president of the Association of Registered Graphic Designers. Leandra Chanji is an editorial and commercial illustrator whose client list includes the New York Times, Nike, the Globe and Mail, and Toronto Life. Her work has been internationally recognized by the Society of Publication Designers, the Society for News Designs, and the Canadian National Magazine Awards. She holds a Master's of Design from NASCAD University and a Bachelor of Fine Arts from Mount Allison University. She's also the artist behind at drawing underscore vicariously and the human behind uh, Lenny the Ween. Recently, she built a portfolio of iconic cannabis brands. Oh, sorry, this is from yesterday. I'm just going to show some of the images. So again, we've got a print from the series. Uh, we've got some of um, Nicola's editorial work, as well as uh, some of the other merchandise from the series. Moderating the Q&A portion of today's session is second year graphic design student Felix Nguyen. Felix was born in Vietnam and moved to Canada three years ago to pursue his dream of becoming a professional designer. He's passionate about branding and hopes to work as a freelancer or at a design agency upon graduating. Welcome, Felix. With that, I'm happy to turn it over to Nicola and Leandra who will start their presentation. Awesome. Thanks, Anarita. Nice to meet you, Felix. We are so happy to be here hanging out with you folks. Um, so hi, George Brown School of Design. Um, first off, congratulations. Just a massive congratulations from Leandra and I. For better or for worse, this year has been truly remarkable. Um, you should be really, really proud of everything you have accomplished this year under such wild circumstances. So whether that is just getting through your first year of school or finishing your program and stepping out into the world, congratulations. We just really need you to know how big of an accomplishment that is. Ooh. <laughs> so we're here to talk to you about self-doubt and imposter syndrome. We'll be doing that by way of The Scaries, a project we created somewhat accidentally. It started as a personal artistic exploration in 2017, crazy, but has since ballooned into a study of the emotional realities of being a creative human. Um, if you want to creep ahead, you can find us at thescariesproject.com or follow us on Instagram at the.scaries. We also need to lay a little groundwork here. We are not experts. We have no formal training in psychology. And the observations we'll be sharing today come directly from our own experiences and those of our Scaries community. 
So Leander and I have been working together both artistically and professionally since 2013. Um, so Anarita gave a great introduction of the two of us and we'll just repeat it so you have a little bit of context for our individual backgrounds. My name is Nicola Hamilton. I am a college trained graphic designer. I graduated from Humber College's graphic design program in 2011. I work independently, which means I'm a freelancer and or solopreneur depending on the day. Currently, I'm working out of my tiny Toronto apartment. Um, we're getting by. <laughs> I've spent my 10 year career working primarily in editorial design. So that's magazines, newspapers and books. I've worked on The Grid, Chatelaine and most recently Best Health, just to name a few. I am a design educator as well. I teach at George Brown, um, first year typography, and I teach at Humber College editorial design. I'm the president of the Association of Registered Graphic Designers, which is also known as RGD. That is a Ooh. volunteer position. I was elected into that spot. Um, and I occasionally draw type and paint things. Yay. When the mood strikes. <laughs> <laughs> So my name is Leandra. I went to school on the East Coast and have a Bachelor in Fine Arts and a Master's of Design. Um, I'm currently working as a full-time freelance illustrator out of my home studio, also here in Toronto. My career started off in graphic design, interning at various design firms here in the city, and then working in editorial design at many of the same publications as Nicola. That's how we met. Um, at a certain point, I decided to follow my passion for illustration and I got up the courage to go out on my own as a freelancer and that's where I'm at today. We're very excited about that. <laughs> so when we talk about our professional lives, we often like to point out that while our day jobs as illustrator and designer for hire are different, the nature of the work is similar. We're both commercial artists, which is to say that our mandate is to translate our clients' visions into the tangible, to amplify their voices, and to communicate their messaging. So working with clients means you're always at risk of losing your own perspective. When you go out into the world after you graduate from George Brown, you're going to start adopting your workplace's processes. You'll start evaluating what's good and not good based on a collective set of principles that may or may not reflect your own ideas. It's natural and it's a good thing to adapt to this new environment, but do it long enough and you might end up a little frustrated, stuck, bored, annoyed. <laughs> I'm not sure that either of us had the right words to describe it, but in 2017, when this project was born, we both sort of found ourselves in a position where we were second guessing a lot in our professional day to day experiences. So, you know, when you send an email and you're immediately <laughs> flooded with regret, ah, why did I use so many exclamation marks? Or you've just sent a pitch off and are crippled by the anxiety of whether or not your client will like it. You spend the next 12 hours in fear of being found out as an imposter. Or you're just simply scrolling through Instagram and comparing yourself to your peers thinking, why do I even bother? After almost 10 years in our respective industries, our confidence seemed to be bottoming out. Why was that? Why were we falling into this comparison trap? Why were we pitting ourselves against our peers online when we know they're only sharing the highlights? We get that they're not doing as amazing as their profiles say they are, but we still felt like we didn't measure up. Why were we so scared to fail? We get that failure has become the sort of valuable part of the process, but we're not that comfortable failing in front of our clients or our bosses, our colleagues, our peers even. And we're pretty sure that they're probably not okay with that either. With all this energy we were expelling, doubting our own abilities even necessary? Probably not, but that doesn't mean we could shake it. So the best that we could do was commiserate about it, which we did often until one of us proposed we do something about it. The details are foggy, but at some point we decided to take action, to do something for ourselves that pushed us out of our comfort zone and also off the computer. The goal was to free ourselves from the constraints of our commercial practices and let ourselves embrace a more artistic practice one that had absolutely no purpose other than to just make stuff. We signed up for an eight week screen printing workshop 
In hindsight, this feels like such a silly little step, but it was the first step to what would become a massive opportunity for emotional and creative growth. It's worth noting that we were signing up for the screen printing class um, with no intention. So that platform for emotional growth was not something we had on our radar. We just really were interested in learning something new and getting off of the computer. So after that class, we take this eight-week screen printing class, we learn something that we hadn't known how to do before. We get to be bad at something, which was an incredible experience, one that neither of us had really felt comfortable in in a long time. Um, we rented some space every Wednesday, actually, to continue practicing our new skills through a collaborative project we dreamed up in a coffee shop, because mm -hmm. that's where the best ideas come. The idea was we'd make a series of screen prints together. Uh, we each create and print one to two layers of those screen prints, so they'd be a true merging of both of our aesthetics. We did three things here that were important in hindsight. We kept ourselves and the project completely off of social media while we were working on it. We set some hard rules around variables such as paper size, ink colors, etc. We kept a messy shared note where we checked in on each other emotionally each week to investigate why we had such a hard time making work just for ourselves. So we made a screen print series, which you'll see a little bit later. And we kept working on this messy journal in our notes app on our phone. Um, and then we made a whole back of these four by six inch paintings in the same style as our screen prints. We made them just to use up the scrap paper and because we were having fun making stuff. So that's what you're seeing on the screen right now. Um, the painted blobs are mine and the sort of sketchy pencil drawings on top are Leandra's edition. So we've got all of these paintings. We've got this series of screen prints. We've got this messy journal we've kept. Um, and at, at this point, we're sort of thinking maybe this is actually worth sharing. There's this funny moment when you're making creative work, and I don't know if you, the audience, have had the opportunity to experience this or not, but you're making stuff and all of a sudden it doesn't feel like it belongs to you anymore. It feels like it belongs out in the world. It's a fleeting moment, one that I know I'm getting better at recognizing as we make more stuff. So we decided to start to share some of our work on social media. Remember, we hadn't shared anything up until this point. And to make the intent of the work more obvious, we started sharing some small statements plucked from that shared note that we were keeping. Statements that reflected our own emotional obstacles throughout the process. Things like, I'm not very good, or I will never do it as well as they can. The thing that surprised us, and again, in hindsight, this makes perfect sense four years into this project, but at the time we were so surprised how much these little statements were resonating with people. Our following was really just our friends and family at that point, but these statements were getting triple the engagement on Instagram as the actual artwork we were sharing. And these conversations around creative fear and self-doubt started popping up in our social lives too. Our friends, our creative friends, wanted to talk about this. Something about the way we put ourselves out there and made ourselves vulnerable made them more comfortable sharing their inner dialogue with us. So in March 2019, we showed the whole body of work in a small gallery space here in Toronto. So these are some pieces from that gallery show. You can see some of our self-doubt or scaries were um, vinyl stuck to the wall around the gallery space. We joked that this was because you never know when that self-doubt and fear is gonna pop up. Um, and here are some photos of those original screen prints that we made. They were editioned in sets of 15. I think we still have a couple of them available in our web shop. Yeah, very few. And as part of that show, we wanted to engage our audience in this dialogue around self-doubt and creative fear, or what by then we were already calling the scaries. So we stuck some vinyl to an empty wall and left some post-it notes and some Sharpies nearby, really just crossing our fingers that folks would get it and want to participate. And they did, which blew our minds. So we've actually been 
This is from that original gallery show. Um, and we've been doing this, the sort of sticky wall at various lectures and workshops that we've put on since then. Um, so here is a little collection of some of those. Um, at first, we found incredible comfort in acknowledging how universal fear around creative work was. And now, a couple of years into observing creative peer, fear, we really do believe that there's huge value in acknowledging your scaries, in, in saying them out loud, sending them into the void, getting them off your chest. These are so good. <laughs> And it's so interesting how many of these fears fall under really similar umbrellas. So a lot of us really are scared of being found out as imposters. We're really scared to try and fail at something. Mm -hmm. We're scared of not doing what we think we are capable of doing. We're scared of never being successful. So the Scaries has changed a lot since the beginning. It still operates as a space for us to collaborate on artistic projects, many of which you can find for sale in our web shop. But it has also grown into a much bigger community interested in exploring the emotional parts of being creative. And like, well, everything, the <laughs> pandemic has thrown a big old wrench in our grand plans for the Scaries. But 14 months into this online existence, we're pretty proud of the pivots we've made to help the community carve out some space to look after their creative selves. We wanted to keep this conversation around the scaries going. And since a huge part of that is the ability to recognize common fears amongst our community, we built this super lo-fi form on our website at the very beginning of the pandemic. We call this the void. Uh, it's a place for our community to unload their scaries. It's absolutely anonymous, and we share them regularly on our Instagram, fully anonymous, as a way to show everyone our following how common some of these thoughts can be. Um, you can head there anytime you want to get something off of your chest. This is the way we share them. Uh, it no feels one really good to just type them out, honestly. <laughs> yeah. Um, and some of them are short and some of them are long and some of them are hyper specific and some of them are broader. And around the end of the semester, we inevitably see a lot of some of the feelings you might be feeling now. So this idea that that I'm scared, I'll never find a design job. It's scary and exhausting to try to make myself known in such a big industry. But for events like today, where we're speaking to a very, oh, rolling backwards, where we're speaking to a very specific group of people, we find it really interesting to be able to see these scaries all together. So we made you, <laughs> yeah. Uh, so we made you your very own sticky wall. Anarita is going to share the link to this Miro board in the chat, if you are not logged into a Miro account, it will come up completely anonymous. And mm -hmm. we encourage you over the course of this conversation, so the rest of our presentation, there's a guest architect hanging out. Um, we encourage you over the course of this conversation, the rest of our presentation and through the Q&A to pop in here and, and leave some of your creative fear, your self-doubt, your negative self-talk <laughs> here on the board, get it off your chest put it out into the world and hopefully you don't have to carry it around anymore. Yes. We will leave this up and we'll come back to it at the end. Please, please, please fill it in. Oh, I Look love at all seeing people. everyone. <laughs> Yay. All right. We will pop back in during the Q&A session and see what you put in here. This brings me so much joy. So and I fun. hope it makes you all feel lighter as well. All right, so another thing we started doing during this pandemic, um, we really missed the ability to connect with our community in real life. So we launched the Scaries Drawing Nights last year. They're on Zoom. They have a 15 person capacity and have allowed us to donate over $2,000 to Canadian charities. The format is pretty simple. 
Our guests bring some drawing and or journaling supplies. We provide a couple of prompts over 90 minutes and we chat along the way, talking all about our fears and feelings and getting them out onto the page. This has been a super rewarding part of the scaries and we hope to keep it up even after the pandemic's over. Yeah. The conversations that have spurred out of these tiny group meetups of strangers for the most part, mm -hmm. sometimes we'll get, you know, a couple of people we know already, a couple of people that have come to more than one drawing night, but for the most part, the group doesn't know each other. Um, yeah. And we've had some pretty incredible networking connections, someone looking to make a podcast and someone else on the call who happens to already be making a podcast. Um, really interesting opportunities to ask for advice as you navigate a specific part of your life or career. That has been really, really interesting. Um, and some like incredibly strengthened and wonderful friendships have come out of this. You know, I can see a couple faces just here on the screen who, you know, were acquaintances that have become friends. So that's always pretty awesome. Maybe we'll even get to do drawing nights in real life someday. That would be ideal. <laughs> We've also, through the pandemic, we've also started polling our Instagram community every week just to check in and see how everyone is doing, but also, you know, for us as well to try to understand common obstacles that creatives are experiencing. Um, so you can see that for the most part, we've been feeling pretty stuck creatively through the pandemic, hanging out around 30% inspired. <laughs> um, but a lot of our community actually has started a creative thing of some sort um, over the course of the pandemic. So it's interesting to see these things shake out. Um, we post these polls every Monday uh, and we'd love to see you participate. It's as easy as following us on Instagram. We haven't totally figured out what we're gonna do with this information yet, mm -hmm. <laughs> but thinking about the results and possibilities is really exciting. And I have no doubt that it's gonna influence whatever the scariest becomes next yes okay so over the past three and a bit years into this exploration we can share a few pieces of advice with you remember we're not experts these are just things we've observed from our own experiences and those of our community so follow your gut your heart your third eye, the universe, whatever that force means to you. These instincts are really important. They're a connection to why we chose to pursue creative work in the first place. Not many of us get into this industry, this design industry, because we want to run a business or make spreadsheets. Um, and when those instincts push you towards something, listen, there's usually a reason or an opportunity there. And even if the attempt at that thing that opportunity doesn't work out, just by the nature of trying, you've already succeeded at growing, at stretching. So if it's important to you, it will matter to someone else too. Put your work out there and make it personal. It will help you find your people because you are not alone and chances are someone else is feeling the same way you are. And most likely there are many, many people that can relate. Use this to your advantage. Create things that are important to you and you will watch a like-minded community grow around you. So flex your creativity by doing that personal work that Leandra just mentioned. See where that takes you. Design education is all about experimentation and exploration and trying weird things and stretching yourself and your creativity. But now that you're heading out into the world, space for that kind of exploration becomes your responsibility to make. You're gonna have to tackle these experiments on your own time and make room for them in your life on your own. So our advice is to do the thing. Even if you're scared, feel that fear, acknowledge it, know it's there, say hi, and do the thing anyway. Look after your creative self, whatever that means to you. To Leander and I, that often means making work for the fun of it without a lot of purpose on a regular schedule. Important. <laughs> for us. So this is a big one. Comparison is not productive. We're talking specifically here about social media. Instagram, for example, definitely has its benefits when you're creative. It helps sharing your work, finding clients, broadening your audience, of course. 
but it also has cons, especially when you're comparing yourself and your work to other people's highlight reels. If you notice that scrolling is making you feel mostly negative, get off your phone and take a break. If you notice a specific account is constantly bringing you down, go ahead and unfollow. It's okay. Even and if it's a friend. Even if it's That's a friend. Okay. <laughs> it's okay to take a break. Um, and don't forget that no one else has your voice or your point of view. So try not to get discouraged when those feelings of self-doubt creep in. When those feelings do creep in and they're going to, acknowledge that negative self-talk. That inner critic can derail you no matter how much experience you have. If you're three days into your career, if you're 35 years into your career, we have asked people at all stages and it exists for almost all of us. The task in front of us is learning how to ride that wave of fear. It's part of everyone's process, how we deal with it, where it pops up, why it pops up, that part's individual, and we all have to deal with that on our own. So for us, putting those negative thought, thoughts out into the wild takes away their power. Saying them out loud feels good. We can acknowledge them and we can move on. So if the scariest has taught us one thing, it really is that creative fear is universal. We all experience it in some way, shape or form. So thank you. We are here to have this conversation with you. So we're gonna encourage you to throw as many questions our way as you can in the next half hour. This really is a safe space to get a little vulnerable. Leandra and I are pretty open and honest when it comes to talking about our experiences in this industry and as creative humans. Mm -hmm. So throw them at us. Thank you so much for that amazing presentation. Um, I personally have a severe case of imposter syndrome, so I can relate to like everything you just talked about. And um, especially when you say it's important to you, if it's important to you, then it's matter to someone else too. I never really look at it that way. So thank you for that. And also you can really help yourself but compare yourself to your peers. And um, I agree it's not productive and it's just something that your brain constantly do. So it's important that you're gonna remind yourself that oh, you have your own ideas too, and they have their own, and uh, you you are unique, and then you're not the same. So thank you so much. Um, I have some questions that I would like to ask you guys, and then we will move on to questions from the audience. So the first question I would like to ask is that, um, as you know, during the pandemic, um, school has been moved online. We at this point have finished uh, two semesters completely online. And uh, I know that a lot of people find that to be very frustrating and draining. And a lot of people can really excel in online classes um, or designers in general. A lot of people I know personally, they have um, experienced like serious self doubts and they just really don't think they're on the right path just because of this whole pandemic. Um, so what advice do you have for like people who are going through something like that or how are they going to survive? Like looking at next semester, potentially being online too. Um, how do you advise them like to get through that or just designers in general? Like how do you get over that? Yeah. I think, Nicola, I think you should feel this one as the, the educator. Yeah, I mean, I think also it's been tough for your educators as well. Um, I think that's worth acknowledging, you know, all of the fun stuff of teaching design has also disappeared, right? So that that moment of connection or being able to see the second that somebody, something clicks for someone that's gone and that's tough. And I think that's also energy that as a design student, you feed off of in the classroom, right? Being able to see your classmates work helps you figure out sort of if you need to, to step it up a little bit or helps you think about things a little bit differently and those opportunities are fewer. Um, I think it's also worth acknowledging that we're probably not going back to a working world that was completely, that is completely the same as it was before. So this kind of virtual remote existence is probably not gonna go away entirely. Um, and so figuring out why it doesn't work for you, I think is one of the most important things. So interrogating, what is it about this virtual thing that's not working for me? Is it that 
I'm not giving myself enough time to decompress before and after class? Is it that I'm staring at the computer screen during, during my breaks as well? Is it that I'm not engaging with my classmates work as often? Do I need to build myself my own group of peers? Um, is it that I'm not being exposed to different influences and need to carve out some time to discover things? Is it that I don't have as much connection to my profs and I really miss that? Most of us are just an email away. Um, so interrogating exactly why it's so hard, I think is something that becomes important. I think we can all acknowledge 14 months in that um, we feel stuck and a little trapped in this existence. Yeah. Um, and I think the burnout and the exhaustion that comes with it is totally okay. Don't forget that we are experiencing a global pandemic. There are fears associated with the last 14 months outside of just having to navigate school online, right? Our lives have been turned pretty upside down. Um, and so remembering that all that human stuff leads into the work stuff as well is important. Does that answer the question? Yeah, I, I think it's, um, it's a really great answer. And I also think what you guys are doing with the scaries is kind of like a form of journaling, which I know mm -hmm. is very helpful um, for people who practice like mindfulness, um, uh, things like that. And it really helps with your mental health. So I think um, the scaries are a really great way for people who are going through something like that to, you know, like just get it off your chest and then it will help you feel better um, and to see that there are other people out there who also like having these same thoughts or like going through the same thing. It's just very like reassuring and knowing that you're not alone in this whole crazy thing. Yes, yes for sure. Yeah. I think also Leandra, as someone who does, has worked virtually and mostly online professionally for years now, are there things that you've done that have helped you like establish some boundaries between work and home or like look after your creative mm -hmm. self? I mean, I think we've probably all heard this throughout the uh, pandemic and working from home, um, you know, try and set out a space for yourself that you can do your work in that's separate from where you watch your Netflix, let's say, if you can. Um, you know, everyone works differently. So figure out what time of day you're maybe the most productive. And it doesn't matter. It doesn't have to be nine to five. Maybe you're a night owl. So, you know, figure out what works for you. Some people like to go for a walk in the morning, pretend you're walking to an office and pick up your coffee and come home. Um, it's really just trial and error. And um, I think we've had a lot of time to have some trial and error. But once you find out, you know, what works for you, try and, you know, cultivate that and stick to it and definitely take time for self care and don't feel guilty when you do need to watch that show on Netflix, because working from home and obviously you guys know doing school from home, like you can just keep going. You can just keep working. You have nowhere else to go. So you have to, you know, take time for yourself and try not to feel guilty about it. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, so the next question I have for you is that um, uh, looking through you guys' work, I know that you both have very distinctive styles and, um, for Leandra, you have your illustration has a very unique styles, and I really love it. And for Nicola, your editorial design work is just absolutely amazing. So, um, how did you manage to like find your personal styles, and what advice you might have for people who are having a hard time finding theirs? <laughs> this is why the series started. <laughs> <laughs> I, I honestly more feeling Felix that is yeah. exactly why we started this I mean yeah. I honestly still feel like I'm working on finding my my personal yeah. style but the the best tips I can give you is um for me illustration if it's important to practice every day um carve out time for yourself to actually just in my case, draw every day, 
doesn't matter what it is, if it's good or bad um, in your mind, you just gotta keep doing it. And I feel like you slowly kind of find your vibe or find your, your niche of what you love. Uh, what do you love drawing? Like, I love drawing plants. <laughs> I love drawing girls. I love drawing scribbles. I don't know if I'd know that if I wasn't just doodling along <laughs> day by day. Um, yeah, another thing is what we talked about in the talk is doing work for yourself because I found I could really get in a spiral of just doing client work, taking their brief and, you know, going with it. And not taking time to just do that personal work and finding your own voice. What do you want to say and what are you passionate about? Yeah. I think when I think about, I've, I've spent since 2017 when I first started sort of interrogating this, this feeling I had that I, I was disconnected from my own voice and my own aesthetic. Um, and I've, so a couple of years of thinking about this. And one of the things that I've started to notice is that my voice isn't always aesthetic. It's not always visual. So my voice and the things that matter to me in my work are bigger than just the final visual product I put out into the world. So, you know, equity is important to me. So the collaborators that I'm bringing on board for my commercial projects, um, that matters. Um, giving space to other creatives to do their thing matters to me. And so being able to open up some of those things is important. Cultivating community is important to me. And so the Scaries becomes a large part of that, my own network teaching and my involvement with organizations like the RGD. So your voice isn't always just, I really like X typeface yeah. or X color. It's so much bigger and broader than that. And I think, you know, we sometimes talk about needing to separate our personal and our professional lives. And that becomes really hard because the people we are create the work that we create and put out in the world. Mm -hmm. um, and to Leandra's point, when you're making things commercially, you're often doing that through the lens of that product or service or business. Um, so when I make editorial work, it's in service of a particular audience, um, not necessarily just for me. So as Leandra said, carving out time to make work for you is important. Leandra does this incredible um, daily doodle um, page where she gives herself 30 minutes-ish. It's gotten a little longer in the last few months. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, where she gives herself 30 minutes every morning to just fill a page in her sketchbook with doodles with no real purpose. Um, and I was super inspired by that to spend, I spent 30 days making, I'm looking to see if they're here and they're not, um, trying to learn how to paint again. It had been a while since I picked up a paintbrush. And so for 30 days, I painted a weird little balancing shape. Um, and those are just really lovely, like self care for your creative self things that help. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's really helpful. And I think a lot of the time too is that, um, some people they just have a hard time of starting up something creatively like i think one of the poll you did is that you asked them uh did you start something creative and there's like about 30 percent people say they didn't so um so can you tell me how do you usually approach a project or like how do you usually like start up something creatively like what steps do you usually take or like um yeah just like what you focus on first or like how do you get into that mindset and you sit down oh i'm gonna do this today something one, creative you know i was gonna say one thing that is has been huge for both nicola and i and i think is pretty universal is setting rules for yourself you can't just it's very hard to just say like i'm gonna practice drawing and i'm gonna draw every day whenever like inspiration hits that, that can be really hard. So if, for example, like Nicola was talking about my daily doodles, I literally say it's 30 minutes, I have to fill one piece of paper, I'm going to use this kind of pen, and usually around the same time, not anymore, because I just had a baby, but <laughs> usually at the same time. So setting parameters for yourself makes it so much easier to actually do it. Whatever you want to do. If you want to journal every day, have your journal out 
on the table, say, I'm going to do this before I do any other work. Set a time limit. For the scaries, we literally picked three colors that we were allowed to use, and we didn't use any other colors. So rules have been a huge one for us. Absolutely. The only way I've been able. Sorry. Cat friend. She likes to make an appearance in all oh. presentations. Um, she has to. <laughs> uh, those rules have been a game changer for me. I think especially as someone who's trained in design where you're used to like having a brief of some sort. So a blank page is terrifying. I think that's also why yeah. I like editorial design. You don't start from nothing. You always start with a grid and a basic body copy size. Um, so, so those rules have made it, made it, made me capable of actually doing something and sticking to something. And um, I think length of time there is something for me as well. So. Uh, Nicola, I think we are having a hard time hearing you. Yeah. I think you got. I don't know I if think you, got you just got muted. Yeah. Maybe it was her headphones. We thought we were <laughs> not going to run into any problem today. <laughs> That's okay. Uh. It says you're muted. Sorry, friends. There we go. Oh, we can hear you now. <laughs> um, I was just saying, I'm not great at sticking to something over the long term. So choosing something like a 30 day time frame to do something every day helps me dramatically. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, definitely. I think rules are definitely really helpful when it comes to that. Um, on my one of my classes last semester, we have a 70 day project where we have to do and design something for 70 days straight um, with like some restriction that we set for ourselves, like using uh, X amount of colors or like minimal topography and things like that. And uh, it did help me a lot uh, to be like, be creative for like, um, almost three months straight. So yeah, roots definitely help a lot. Yeah. Um, the next question I have for you guys are, uh, is that have you ever like run into like a, a creative block? And if so, like, how do you get yourself out of it? Like, how do you unstuck yourself creatively? <laughs> well, <laughs> definitely I've hit creative blocks often. Um, there's different ways I deal with it. Some, sometimes I would say literally just stepping away from the work and saying, you know what, I need to just do nothing tonight or talk to my friends or, you know, chill um, and then come back to it. Because sometimes if you're just pushing it too much, you're you're just not right in the right headspace. You might literally just need a nap. <laughs> so um, that's one thing. Another thing is going back to that kind of set of rules. And sometimes you're not inspired. Sometimes you're, you're not feeling it, right? So, but if you said you were gonna do doodles for 30 minutes every morning and you still do them, even if they're crap or you just literally scribble a big scribble over the page, it might help you overcome that feeling. Those are kind of two things that I go to. Sometimes you just need a nap. <laughs> yeah. Um, I notice creative blocks, not so much when I'm staring at the project, but when I'm avoiding the project. <laughs> so I will fill my time with other responsibilities because that project scares me or I don't really have an answer or maybe it's slightly out of my yeah. comfort zone. Um, and for me, that's really just about sitting down and starting. And the easiest thing for me to do is to remind myself that no one has to see your shitty first draft. You know, it doesn't have to be perfect right out of the gate. Whatever mess of visual vomit I throw out on the page on the first go yeah. is just for me. I don't have to share it if I don't want to. Usually I do end up sharing it but removing that 
um, responsibility of it having to be perfect right away helps. Yeah, for sure. definitely. Thank you. Uh, so we're going to move on to some questions from the audience. Um, first one's from Jasmine. Uh, she say, I admire how vulnerable these statements are. Uh, when you experience really long periods of burned out, it sometimes seems like you can never get out of it. Any tips uh, when you fall into this hole? It's tough. <laughs> it's, burnout's really hard and it's totally real. And I think, you know, the way out of it is to give yourself a break, a guilt free break. And that can be tough. Um, you know, I experienced a really big period of burnout in early, late 2019, I guess. And, um, you know, for me, the, the way out of it was to just take a bunch of months off. Mm -hmm. um, which is scary and hard, but that helped. Um, or to remove myself from some of those projects that were making me feel really burnt out. I think mm -hmm. sometimes creative burnout has more to do with things, the kind of work you have on your plate than it does with your ability to look after your creative self. Um, so sort of sifting through like, what is it that makes me feel this burnt out? Um, I've heard a pal of mine who's very good at journaling and, and distilling thoughts in her dialogue actually makes a matrix. So like four quadrants and the axis of the, of the quadrants are things I'm good at, things I'm bad at, things I like and things I don't like. Um, and she'll actually map her entire couple of weeks, couple of days of things she works on down to the like emailing this person do I like that? Do I not like it? Am I good at it? Am I bad at it? To start to see some of those patterns and trends it can be interesting. So smart. Yeah. Lange agrees with me. Hi, Lange. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you so much. Yeah, I think I've experienced burned out a lot too. And um, taking breaks definitely helps a lot. You just yeah. keep your mind off of it and then just come back to it with like a fresh eye and then yeah, it would get better. Yeah, another thing I would say is if you end up um, a freelancer, very easy to say yes to absolutely everything that comes your way. Doesn't matter if it's paid well, not paid at all. You kind of have that instinct to just say yes, because you're freelance, you, you gotta take it, right? Um, that can really- Feast your famine. Out. Yeah, so, you know, learning to say no, um, to things that you know are going to bring you to that place is also important to think about. Yeah, yeah definitely. Um, I will caveat that with I am still learning how to say no. <laughs> yes, I, it's very hard. Yeah, I, uh, me too. I have the same problem. Like I would say yes to any project thrown my mm -hmm. way, even if it's like so boring and I have like no interest in, but yeah. you know, it paid. So, <laughs> but then while working on it, I would be like, oh my God, this is driving me crazy. This is so boring. <laughs> well, and I think that resentment can lead to burnout so much faster than just having to expel a lot of creative energy, right? The, the sort of inner dialogue and the um, walls you put up around work you don't want to do. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's pretty exhausting. The next Hi, question, the next Sorry. question is, fancy, is um, sometimes I go too long without a break and then feel guilty when I need extra time off. How do you know when it's too much time off? Yeah, I mean, I think, look, hustle culture, real thing. Hopefully it's a thing that we are uh, paying a little bit more attention to over the last couple of months, last year or so. Um, we have been working more and more hours um, over the last decade, two decades, um, we've become more and more efficient and that's tough, right? Those expectations are really hard. Acknowledging how, how you work and how you need to work is important as creatives. I think remembering that one of our skill sets is thinking like critical thinking, design thinking. Um, and sometimes that doesn't look like work. Sometimes that looks like going for a walk. Sometimes that looks like exploring a neighborhood we've never been in. Sometimes that looks like exploring the deepest, darkest voids in the internet. Um, 
And so acknowledging that that's all sort of part of the work is important. So how sometimes I go too long without a break and then I feel guilty when I need extra time off. How do you know when it's too much time off? Um, I mean, that depends on, on who and where you work, right? Do you have that flexibility to take off the time that you think you need to take off? Um, I think that's all individual. Each person has a different experience. Obviously, you will work in workplaces where you have access to only a couple of weeks of paid time off. Um, but find out if you have access to unpaid time off. And if that's something that is accessible to you financially, then amazing. Um, if it's not, maybe looking for a place that offers you more time off. Um, I think there is no such thing as too much time off. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So the next question from Dominic, um, say, can you give an example of a time that you felt that something you were working on wasn't good or going well, but that another person was able to see that it was and support you? Um, All the time. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I was going to say this might be more, more for you, Nicola, just because as a freelance illustrator, I tend to work in a vacuum. <laughs> I think, but also not. Like I'm thinking a little bit about mine and Leandra's collaboration, both, you know, I hire Leandra as an illustrator pretty often and we collaborate. Mm -hmm. And there are times when Leandra sends sketches and she was like, I don't know about these. And as soon as I see them, I'm like, true. no, they're perfect. <laughs> like, these are great. Okay, um, you just proved me wrong. <laughs> but, but also the same, you know, in the way that we were putting this talk together and I sent my shitty first draft to Leandra and I was like, I don't know, it all falls apart here. And she was like, actually, it doesn't at all. Um, we can be our own worst critics. Yeah. Um, okay, but Dom's asking for a specific example. Um, okay, I'm going to use the series as an example because I think it's an easy one, but these kinds of things pop up for me pretty often. Um, you know, working in editorial design, you often design a couple feature openers. And when you share them with the editorial team working on it, um, they can sometimes surprise you and the ones that they pick are the ones that they gravitate towards. Um, we are not our best um, curators, I guess, sometimes. Um, so the scary is when Leander and I made all of those tiny four by six inch paintings, as part of the original Scaries project, I just went and painted a bunch of blobs and I tried my hardest not to think about it too much. I did go through them all and sort of had some favorites. There were some darlings in there for sure. Um, and, you know, there were some that I didn't like at all. And I dropped them off to Leandra and we're talking like 120 of them, like a lot. And I dropped them off to Leandra and Leandra interpreted them completely different. She had no context for how I envisioned them or what I was thinking or feeling when I made them. And she added her own voice on top of those and it completely changed my relationship to them. So some of the ones that were my least favorites became my favorites. And so I think that kind of collaboration and conversation around your work can be so helpful. Sometimes it's like the tiniest tweak, right? Sometimes it's someone who, who can say like, you try making that photo black and white instead of color or like, do you try a sans serif instead of a serif? That might just change everything. Um, I feel like there's these tiny examples of this that I experience all the time. Um, I even think about specifically with Dom, um, you know, we're working on building a conference program and I will throw out a dumb idea in our collective Slack channel um, and the group will make it so much better, right? They'll elaborate on that and pile on better ideas. And I think that's pretty cool. Yeah, I think we always are like worst enemy. Like we talk to ourselves so harshly and we, we, we don't talk to other people the way that we talk about ourselves. And so sometimes it's just, it just really bad. Um, but then if you have someone in your life that can pull you back from it, it's like, oh, these are actually pretty good. And it would just be very reassuring. Um, so we have, time for one more question, and then maybe we'll, we'll go visit the mural board, see what people have to say over there. Uh, so the last question is from Jasmine. Do you have any positive messages of self-talk that you tell yourself when facing your scaries? Can I swear? <laughs> <laughs> Mine is not necessarily positive, but it's just fucking do it. 
<laughs> sit down and do the thing. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think some of our last slides are kind of uh, things that we tell ourselves uh, when we have those negative thoughts, like comparison is not productive, you know, scrolling through Instagram and I'm saying negative things to myself, just reminding myself of these things that we just talked about in our talk. Um, also, if you want to scroll through our Instagram, <laughs> oftentimes when we post a negative self-talk, we kind of reverse it in the, in the caption. So, um, if there's a specific one that's calling to you and you want to, you know, kind of see the reverse, you can also check out our Instagram. We have a lot of examples of that. There's um, a piece of advice that a pal, Laura Grady of mine, who is a body positivity activist and writer, um, Laura always talks about talking to yourself the way you would talk to your best friend. And I think that that's such a lovely way to think about your inner dialogue as it relates to so many things. And I think that's partly why there's so much power in, in saying those negative things out loud. As soon as you write them down or say it, um, you can look at it and, and logically <laughs> reverse it, right? Yes. Um, and Leandra and I have found so much joy in pep talking each other and being each other's cheerleader and then being a cheerleader for these anonymous scaries community yeah. folks who are submitting their fear. Um, so if you can think about talking to yourself the way you would talk to a best friend. Because um, again, we are often our own worst enemy. Yeah. Felix sure. said. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah, I think we're gonna go and visit the uh, mirror board and see Yay! what people have put down. There's so much there. action. Oh, there's Yay! so many. <laughs> Let's go for a little tour. Oh, this is fun. It is fun. Don't have the motivation to do anything or try something new. That's fair. I think you should go take a nap. Yeah. You deserve it. <laughs> Eat some chips and have a nap. Oh, yes. Watch some So Bad It's Good TV. I need to constantly ask for other people's opinions and can't decide whether my work is good enough. Um, your work is good enough. It is always good enough. You made it. No one else can make it the same way you can. Ooh, what if designing is not for me? Um, you get to define what designing for you is. It's different for all of us. I know there are some sort of more senior peeps in the chat, and I promise you that they have all experienced a moment where they were like, I don't know if I like this anymore. Yeah. What do you see yeah, in here, That's a very most common one. Like, I think every creatives have like that thought pops in their head like what if this is not for me i mean and you can always change it i i did graphic design for many years and um i i barely do anymore as my focus has completely changed to illustration um so you don't have to you know always follow the the exact path that you yeah. think you have to follow yeah my parents will never understand what I do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I get that. I neither. <laughs> <laughs> um, some t uh, a talk yesterday, we were talking about uh, BIPOC students. Um, there's a lot of them saying that their parents don't understand why they want to do like graphic design or anything creative. So they end up doing like PowerPoint presentation, telling their parents like, oh, this is why I'm doing this and doing that. I love that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. My peers will judge me. Find new peers. Those peers suck. Yeah. <laughs> um, Unfollow. <laughs> I mean, I will say that the, the judgment, the comparison thing, that's a real thing that we all experience. Um, the design community, there, there are absolutely gatekeepers and people who are unkind. And that's usually their own bullshit. Um, they're probably not the people you want to work for or hang out with. And there are so many other people that are incredibly supportive and welcoming um, and excited and enthusiastic about your work. You know, I, there are pals in this chat right now that did not have to show up here and listen to Leandra and I talk about the series again. 
and they're here and I love it and appreciate them. Um, so there are peers out there. If you are making the kind of work you want to make, they will find you, you will find them. Yeah. And if not, come hang out with us. <laughs> yeah, come to a drawing night. Um, this is absolutely amazing. I think we're running out of time and I think we have a talk right after. Mm -hmm. So um, we're gonna wrap it up, but this mural ball, I hope that you will post this somewhere so we can always like go back to it and look at all these uh, thoughts that people have so that um, we don't feel alone in this because this is really helpful. I love this. Um, so yeah, thank you so much for an amazing presentation. Uh, it's very insightful. I've learned a lot and uh, yeah, thank you so much. For our next talk, uh, we're going to have a talk with uh, Jay Wall and Kayla Jack at one about design for social change. And then after that, we also have a talk at 2 p.m. with Sydney Allen Ash on what we talk about when we talk about money. So uh, make sure to go register for those talks uh, on the yes.schooldesign.ca website. And follow us on our Instagram as SOD underscore, yes, underscore SOD, I think. So thank you so much again for Nicola and Leandra. It's an amazing presentation. And uh, I'm so excited to see what the scaries have in store uh, in the future. Thanks, Felix. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Thank you for all of your vulnerability and your questions. I can't wait to dig through this wall either. We'll leave it up so it's here for you. Yes, yeah, that <laughs> wait, thank you.